Well, good morning, 10 o'clock service. Well, how many of you uh, normally come at nine, but you decided to come today just to sleep in? I see your hands. Yeah, a few of you. We had some of you at the 11 o'clock, I mean, the 5.30 service last night. It's really throwing me off. It's like, what are you doing here? You're like, you don't sit there normally, and you know, it's the wrong service. And, so, uh, hey, it's just great to have you. And if we haven't met yet, my name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here. We're going to go into our time of teaching today. And so you'll definitely need that note sheet inside your program. We're going to be using it a lot. For those of you joining us online, welcome. And you can download the, the format of your, your choice there on your screen. But if you guys are ready to, ready to go, I'm ready to jump in. You guys ready to go? OK, let's pray. But Father, we're thankful to be here in your house on your day under the leadership of your spirit, under the authority of your word. And Lord, we just thank you so much for what you're doing in our church right now, what you're doing in our lives, how, how you're waking us up and, and calling us to life and being able to discern your voice increasingly clearly. And we pray, Lord, as we continue this series today and, and talk about this important topic of discernment, that you would lead us every step of the way. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Well, our story starts today on a, on a chilly October evening, and uh, this is a an evening he's been dreading for the last week. And uh, this last week, he's faced a very difficult decision, um, one that he's wrestled to make. Uh, but as hard as it is to make it, what's, what's really challenging, what he's dreading the most is that, that tonight is the night that he has to deliver the message. So his story starts a couple, a couple of months before. Uh, that's where they'd met. They'd started dating. And uh, their relationship was truly magical. It was better than any relationship he'd ever experienced in his life up to this time. And he often felt that like they were in a, like the two leading characters in a romantic drama. It's almost like looking for the cameras, where are they? Because it was so magical. And yet at the same time, there was a storm brewing deep within his soul. It had been there from the very beginning of their relationship. He tried to ignore it. He tried to push it down. He hoped it would change. But instead, it just keeps on picking up speed. The emotional winds are now at gale force. He's, he's feeling that hurricane. And so the time has come where he knows that he can't push this down anymore. He can't ignore it. He has to face it. He has to face it head on. And tonight is the night. Well, today, we're continuing this series that we've been in for eight weeks now. We're, we're getting close to the end, just this week and two more weeks. And uh, the, the name of the series is Hearing God Discerning His Voice. And for those of you who are brand new, I always like to take just a moment at the top and kind of bring you up to speed. Uh, we know that God's bringing a lot of new people here. Last time we had a Next Step dessert, like 25 new people are just coming. You know, I announced it last week. We have this story. We had 47 people. So it's just a time of growth. And so, so in a nutshell, what this series is about is a core concept is that, uh, that we believe based on the teaching of Jesus, the Bible, our life experience, that God is still speaking today to his people. And that one of the most important and critical skills in our life as followers of Jesus is learning to, to hear, to recognize, to respond to the voice of God. And this is one of the most important skills that we need to develop if we truly want to, to have what we, we would describe as a truly personal relationship with God if we want to truly experience his presence and his power in our lives and through our lives, and if we want to carry out our life calling, his vision for our lives. And so if you've been with us in this series, uh, four weeks ago, we began to talk about the wide variety of ways that God speaks to us. Of course, the first and most important way is through his written word, the scriptures. But we've also looked in a couple weeks, we talked at the wide variety of other ways, from dreams or visions. We see these all in the scripture. We uh, the still small voice, the audible voice, uh, uh, inner voice, uh, through prophetic words and so on. And then last week we turned a major corner and we said, okay, so when we believe that God is speaking to us, how do we discern whether this voice or whether this message, this idea, how do we discern if that's coming from ourselves or it's coming from the Lord or coming from even the enemy? And so if you're here last week, uh, I, I began to tackle, introduce like seven key questions that we can ask uh, when we, we think that God is speaking to help us discern. So last week we covered the first two. Today we're gonna, we're gonna finish with the final five. So there on your note sheet, you have a section that's called Hearing God, Discerning God's Voice. 
And uh, I want to just quickly hit on the first two from last week by, by way of quick review. If I'd been on my game, I would have filled in the blanks. You don't have to take the time to do that, but I wasn't. So uh, I'm just going to give them to you, hit them real quick, and they're going to serve a, as a foundation for where we go today. So the first one that we talked about was the message. For each of these, there's a key word or phrase and then a question that goes with it. And so the first one had what I call the message, and does it align with Scripture is the question. And so we've talked about this throughout this series, that this is the most important question. Whatever we sense God may be speaking, we need to ask the question, does, does this message align with Scripture? Now, as, as we talked about last week, that, does it, that question doesn't always apply, uh, but it's very important that we start there because what we've learned throughout this series time and time again is that the Holy Spirit who inspired the Holy Scriptures is never going to lead us in a way that violates the Scriptures. And so we started there. Then second, I introduced this concept number two of spiritual intuition. And the question was, do I have peace about this? And so we, we talked about this. When, when a man or woman comes to Jesus, that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus promised that when the Spirit comes, that he will lead us into all truth. And one of the ways he does this is by giving a sense of spiritual intuition, almost a spiritual sixth sense of what's right and true and good. And so one of the questions we can ask whenever we're facing a major decision, whenever we sense that God may be speaking is, do I have peace about this? And remember that I'm using the term peace in a technical sense. I'm not simply asking, how do I feel about this? Do I like this idea? Does it make sense to me? I'm asking such deeper in that, in that deeper plate, deeper than emotion, in that place deeper than thought where the Holy Spirit resides in our life, do I sense the Holy Spirit putting his peace on this direction or this word that I believe is from the Lord? And so we talked about this, that often that the Lord will have peace about the very last thing we want to do, right? So that laid a foundation. So today I want to build on that and ask five more questions. We'll take these first two with us. They'll apply at different places. But the third question goes like this, that, the, the fill in the blank is the qualities. The key word is the qualities. And the question are, is, what are the characteristics? And so when it comes to the human voice, like when we recognize each other's voice, like if you go to a, uh, an animated film, for example, they can have very famous voice actors on there, right? And so it's why we go, because we, we recognize these voices, these famous people in these, in these key uh, these, these key animation kind of you know, uh, characters. Uh, you think of a child, when a child is growing up, a, a baby is born, that child learns very quickly to discern the voice of their mother or the voice of their father. And, and if you think about it, it's not about the content, it's about the characteristics of the voice, like the pitch, the, the cadence, uh, the, the tone of the voice. And so in a similar way, that when, when we, as we learn to hear the voice of God, there are certain, uh, certain characteristics of the voice, and these characteristics are described in the Holy Scriptures. Right? So let me give you like three examples of this. Maybe I'll throw in a fourth one, but you can see three bullets there, all right? So the first one, the first example would be what I call the weight, the weight of the voice, and what I mean is that when God is speaking to us, when an idea comes, uh, God's putting his thoughts into our thoughts, so a voice comes, a prophetic word, there's a sense of weight. There's a sense of maybe power. There's a sense of authority. I like the word gravitas. It, it just comes with a different sense of weight to it. Uh, and we see this, of course, in the scripture, like in Psalm 29, the psalmist says, the voice of the Lord, and of course, when we see Lord all caps, what's that mean? Yeah, he says, so the voice of the Lord, of Yahweh, is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. And there's a sense when God is speaking, you sense that power, um, that majesty in the voice. Um, you see this in the teaching of Jesus. Uh, when, he, when he would get through his teaching, Matthew says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, it says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had what? Authority. And I believe that Matthew is saying more than just his style of teaching was he didn't quote all the rabbis like the other rabbis did. 
I guess what he's saying is there was something about his words that carried weight. They carried authority. You sensed in them, these were like profound. They're more than just the words of a man. There's truth coming out of them. Um, this week, as we continue our, our life group study on this topic, we'll be reading pages through as we've been doing in, in Dallas Willard's book, Hearing God. And he quotes one of the uh, uh, kind of a great spiritual leader of the last century, E. Stanley Jones. And look how Jones describes this. He says, the voice of the subconscious argues with you. It tries to convince you. But the inner voice of God does not argue. It does not try to convince you. It just speaks and it has, catch this word, self-authenticating. This kind of takes in that sense I thought of spiritual intuition. It's just you sense it like this is different. There's something about this voice is different. He says it has a feel of the voice of God within it. All right, so the, the first quality would be the weight. The second quality would be the word tone. Now, I really struggled with the right word for this. Um, Dallas, and you're reading this this week, he will use the word spirit, but that's hard for me to connect with. So I was looking for another word, and I, I landed on tone. And what I mean by this is that when someone speaks to us, it's not just the content of what they say that communicates, it's the tone of voice. So for example, a lot of us remember when we were growing up, some of you are still living at home right now, you'll remember this, you'll have your mother say to you, I don't like your tone of voice. <laughs> and we know instantly what she means. It's not what we said, it's how we're saying it. And that our tone is communicating. It might, might be sarcasm, or it might be with the rolling of eyes. It might be, we think you're ridiculous. But we're saying our tone is communicating. And in a similar way, when God speaks, there's a certain tone to it. It's not just what he says. It's the spirit or the tone that it carries with it. Uh, let me give you some examples. Um, when uh, early in this series, I had a friend of mine here at the church uh, sent me a chart. You see it there in the note sheet. I'd seen this kind of chart before, just forgotten about it, but I was thankful that she sent it to me. And it kind of contrasts the voice of the Lord versus the voice of the enemy. And, like, you, and this is what I'm talking about, tone. So let's take a look at that. This is that God voice, God's voice calms, but the enemy's voice obsesses or leads us to obsession. Uh, God's voice comforts, enemy's voice worries. God's voice convicts, and the enemy's voice condemns. This is a powerful one. The enemy, when the enemy is speaking, he's going to condemn. I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you're that kind of person. You should be more mature like that. What's wrong with you? Now catch this, when God convicts us, he can speak very directly and very powerful truth. For example, in Revelation chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to the church of Laodicea, he says, you think that you're rich, you're well-clothed, and you can see clearly. But he said, the reality is that you're naked, you're poor, and you're blind. That's hard truth. But the difference is, is that when Jesus speaks hard truth, you sense this, he's speaking not to attack us or tear us down, He's speaking to build us up. And you sense that different spirit, like the rebuke of a friend who truly loves us and cares of us versus the criticism of an enemy who's trying to destroy us. Uh, on this one, when I was first working on this message, I wrote down just some, some thoughts of my own on this. And I said, I put it this way, when I, um, that what the Lord challenges without shame. The enemy is shame. It's all about you. You're that kind of person. You're his problem. It's your fault. You're the issue. It's about shame. The Lord's never, it's more about behavior and attitudes. It's not about, it's not attacking our core person. Um, here's another one I wrote down, that he rebukes without condescension. And he enlightens without embarrassment. As you continue down this list, it says that God's voice encourages, uh, enemies discourages. Uh, God's voice, uh, and I think throughout the scripture, how many times that God comes to someone in a tough situation and says, fear not. 
where the enemy comes and what do you think you're going to do? You're going to fail. You can never do this. What do you, what, what's got into you? Like, what do you think, who do you think you are? Um, that God's voice leads, the enemy's voice pushes. You know, Jesus, come to me on the water. He's not saying, get out of the boat, have a little faith, get with it. Right? Jesus says, come to me. Um, the God's voice reassures, the enemy's voice frightens. God's voice stills, the enemy's voice rushes. I love what, what Dallas writes. Remember, he uses the word spirit to describe what I'm calling his tone. But he says, the voice of God speaking in our souls also bears within itself a characteristic spirit. It's a spirit catches of exalted peacefulness and of confidence, of joy, of sweet reasonableness, and of goodwill. Okay? So what, what, what is the tone? The third, the third key word is the word impact. And what I'm saying here is when, when the Lord speaks, it's not just the content, it's not just the tone, but it's the impact it has on the hearer. So for example, let me give you an example in Psalm 19. I want you to see how David describes the word of the Lord, full of the right content, the right tone, but then, then pay attention to the impact it has on us. So for example, he says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Okay, it's right, it's good, it's true. Um, but, it's, but it has the impact, it refreshes the soul. Uh, so statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, they're true, you can take them to the bank, but the impact it has, it makes us wise. The precepts of the Lord are right. He's always going to speak what's right, what's good, and what's true, but he says the impact is it gives joy to our hearts. The commands of the Lord are radiant, the impact it gives light to the eyes. We can now see clearly. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. So the second question deals with, with the quality of the voice, the characteristics. And these three I want to highlight are the weight, the sense of authority, the tone, harsh, uh, harsh or, or full of peace and confidence. Uh, and then finally, the, the, the impact. How does it like, what does it create in you? Now, I'm going to throw in a fourth one just for free, all right? I knew I wouldn't have time for this, so I only gave you three, but I'm just going to pretend we do have time. And so I'm going to throw it in. So number four is the word creativity. The one of the things I've noticed is that when the Lord speaks, and especially if it's like a prophetic word, the Lord gives you a prophetic word for yourself or someone else, that often one of the, the characteristics, it tends to be very creative, in fact, it may not even be at all like the person delivering the word. Like, let me give you an example. Last week, I gave this example of a time here early in our days at Rocky Peak that we're, we're rocky, no pun intended, and we were dealing with issues. And, uh, and, and so there was a scary time having people to our house and so on, talk about those issues. And remember, the Lord gave Lynn a picture of an airplane in a, uh, in a tremendous storm and then he spoke a single word. Remember that? Turbulence. Now, Lynn is not a pilot, and she doesn't use the word turbulence. Right? I don't think I've ever heard her use that word like in normal conversation. But this was what I'm saying. And I found that often when Lynn has a word for me, that it's like this. It's very creative. It's like very powerful. Uh, from time to time, people in, the, in our church will say, I was praying, I feel like the Lord has a word for me. That, that I would say more times than not, I don't really resonate with that, but I'm always open to it. And the times it does, it often has this creative kind of twist of phrase or, or turn of phrase that's just very, it's very interesting. You know, that's, that's kind of like, it's letting the Lord know this, this is not something this person thought up. You know, this is from me. All right. So let's move on. So the fourth question. The fourth question deals with staying power. And the question is, does it last? So one of the marks of when the Lord speaks is that he doesn't have to change his mind or change directions. You know, you and I, when we speak, uh, we'll often change our mind or change plans because we don't know the future. Our circumstances may change. We grow and change. What's our priorities that change over time? And so, so we will often plan one thing and then later on do something different. But I want you to think about it. The Lord is not like that. Like he doesn't, he's not going to get any new information that's going to change the way he looks at something. He's not going to, hey, I didn't see this coming, but if I had, I would have told you this. 
right? So he, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows you like the back of his head. He knows what the circumstance is going to be. His values aren't going to change. And so when the Lord speaks, then his word is firm, the psalmist says. It endures. Uh, in Isaiah 40, there in your note sheet, <coughs> the prophet Isaiah writes, <coughs> The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord, what? Endures forever. Which means what he, he's not going to tell you one thing today and something else two weeks from now. In fact, this is an interesting way to, to judge this. If you have someone in your life, or maybe this is you, hopefully not, but you have someone in your life that's always, the Lord's always speaking to them. The two weeks ago, it was to go back to college, and then this week, he's like, the Lord said, oh, no, that's not, we're going to go this way, and you're going to do this. He's changing directions. It's almost for sure not the Lord. At least one of those things is not the Lord, because he's not going to be changing his mind. There's a beautiful verse uh, back in the book of Numbers. The situation is the king of Moab has hired this kind of sorcerer, false prophet named Balaam to come and put a curse on the nation of Israel. Israel, and when when he, when he comes, uh, he he every time he tries to to he tells him, I can only say what the Lord gives me, and every time he goes to curse him, blessing comes out of his mouth, and so the king is super frustrated. He's like, I'm paying you all these big bucks. Well, let's let's find a different mountain, a different perspective. Maybe you can curse him from there, but it keeps on failing, and finally at the end, Balaam, this false prophet, he says, Look, God is not human that he should lie. He's not a human being, that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? When God is speaking, he's not going to change his mind. Now, the one exception to this, we see it in Scripture, is when there's repentance involved. So, for example, God told Jonah, go to the city of Nineveh and announce it in 40 days. I'm going to destroy it. He does that, but they, they repent and turn to God, and God says, okay, I'll relent. But in general, like God is, like God's not going to change his mind. And so this is very practical, because let's say that you're praying, and uh, you have this thought that's kind of a random thought out of nowhere that it's time to move and leave California, okay? And so is that from the Lord or not? Well, we don't know yet, right? So maybe you share it with your wife at Hey, the, I, it's really interesting. This, I felt like it was from the Lord. Here's one, th- one way we can test this. Let's just wait on that. Because if it's from the Lord, that sense of power, that sense of gravitas, that sense of authority, it will continue to speak. It will not diminish. And when Lynn gives me a word from the Lord, I can come back to it three years later, and it still speaks with power. It's still right on. Because it's, it's, it's not going to change. It's from the Lord. And so this is just practical that, that I know in my own life, when I sense the Lord leading in my own life or as a church, unless it demands immediate decision, I'm not going to make immediate decision. I'm just going to continue to wait on the Lord and pray about that because if it's from him, he'll continue to confirm it and, it become, and it actually will probably grow stronger as time goes on. So that's a fourth question. A fifth question is repetition, does it reoccur? Now, this is not always the case. The Lord is always going to repeat this, but, but often in our lives, uh, when the Lord speaks to us, and I think especially when he's speaking through the still, small voice, kind of when God is putting his thoughts in our thoughts, for example, that often he will repeat that multiple times. And one of the main reasons for this is often, especially as we're just learning to hear the Lord's voice, we don't recognize it the first time as the Lord's voice. A great example of this, we talked about it the very first week of this series, what thought the prophet Samuel in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 3, that the very first time that God spoke to Samuel, he was a young boy, it's in the middle of the night, and he hears this voice saying, Samuel... And he wakes up and he goes to the old priest, Eli, assuming that Eli is calling him. And Eli says, I didn't call you, go back to bed. This is going to repeat two more times. And on the third time, 
Eli realizes what's going on. So even Eli's not realizing what's going on. And he says, hey, the next time it happens, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So notice what's going on is the Lord is repeating it because we're not catching it the first time. And this is something to pay attention then because often, and I think this is especially with kind of random thoughts. Like you have a random thought that comes to you that, hey, maybe it's time to like go back to school. You know, maybe you're, you're mid-career and you have this random thought. And you're like, where did that come from? That's really weird. And you just don't think much about it. And then two weeks later, you have the same random thought comes back again. And then maybe one of your friends, you're talking about your frustration in your current career. And they say, have you ever thought of maybe going back to school and changing direction? And the moment they say it, all of a sudden you remember these two previous times And so what does this mean? Does it mean it's for sure of the Lord? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But what it means is, hey, we need to pay attention, and now we need to bring that before the Lord. Lord, are you trying to get my attention? Are you trying to speak to me? And Dallas talks about this there in your note sheet. He said, just keep this practical advice in mind that when thoughts reoccur, always stop prayerfully to consider whether this may be an appearance of the Lord's candle or whether the thoughts have some other significance. So what does it mean, the Lord's candle? Well, there's a verse in Proverbs that means a lot to Dallas. It's not on your note sheet, but if you want to write it down, it's Proverbs 20, verse 27. And what it says is that the human spirit is the candle or the lamp of the Lord. And the way Dallas understands this is that that when the Lord wants to direct our attention and our thoughts, it's like like the Holy Spirit kind of holds up a a candle in our spirit or a a lamp to illumine certain thoughts that we suddenly become aware of. And that this is one of the ways the Lord begins to get us like thinking about something. And so he says, hey, when when this is happening, and you see this repetition, it doesn't necessarily mean it's in the Lord, but we need to pay attention because this is often how it starts. And notice what he says in uh, last, he says, although the reoccurring thoughts are not always an indication that God is speaking, They're not to be lightly disregarded. And so the question of repetition. Number six. Number six, the the word is confirmation. And the question is, are there multiple sources? So what I found, and you see this in Scripture sometimes, you see this sometimes when, uh, remember like Peter had a vision in Acts 10 of the sheet coming down from heaven full of unclean animals. And the, the vision repeated three times. Um, you'll see this kind of concept of repetition coming, uh, but also not just from one source, but from a variety of sources. Now, this is not always the case, but I think it's often the case when we're making a major life decision. Okay, so not always normal, but let me give you a couple examples. This week, we're going to have you read for your life group study a PDF it's a final chapter. It's the epilogue of a book by a very famous, gifted British pastor of the last century. His name was G. Campbell Morgan. And he wrote a little book called The Will of God. In the epilogue, he talks about this. He says, hey, when God is leading you, uh, watch as he confirms it in three ways. So he says, here's three. Like, he'll confirm it, first of all, through Scripture. Like, he'll give you a passage of Scripture. He just sends this for you. Secondly, he'll confirm it by the Holy Spirit, right? Through maybe the still small voice or that intuitive peace or whatever. He said the third way that he'll confirm it is through circumstance, like an open door, for example. And so he says, so pay attention to these kind of God confirming it in three different ways. Now, quick, quick, uh, quick little sidebar here. Let's talk about open doors just for a second. One of the biggest mistakes we can make in hearing the voice of God is assuming that every open door that God is leading us. Like an open door becomes important when it's in conjunction with other ways God is speaking to us, not by itself. Like, let me give you an example, just a complete made up example. Let's say that I'm praying for a new motorcycle. This is all myth- <laughs> just kind of, this is all just mythical, right? How- like, I'm praying, I've got my mind on the particular motorcycle. I've been researching it, and I stop by the shop uh, where I go from time to time, and they have the exact motorcycle on sale, right? 
And I, I say, thank you, Lord. That's an open door, right? It's an open door. And I buy the motorcycle and I say, yeah, God just opened a door for this, right? Okay, so this is all hypothetical, right? All hypothetical. Let's say this is also true of my life. Now, this is not true of my life. But let's say it's also true of my life. That as I walk into that shop, I'm $50,000 in debt on my credit cards. I have four motorcycles in my garage that I haven't used, right? Do you see? It's like, this doesn't make sense. This is not from the Lord. The Lord's not going to tell me to go spend 15 grand on a new motorcycle I don't need but only want when I'm 50,000 in credit card debt, you see? And so this, this becomes, especially for younger believers, or as we're learning to discern the voice of God, we're very too quick. Sometimes we'll even do this in a magical way. Well, I saw this street sign. It had 555, and I've been praying for five months on five things. And it's like, there it is. You know, it's like God is speaking to me. It's like God is not a Ouija board, right? He's not like, uh, this is not your horoscope. That's not the way this works. And so, but notice what Campbell Moore, he's not just saying an open door. He's saying God spoke to you through his word. He speaks through your spirit. And now he speaks through an open door. Right? Okay, so the, that's a concept of confirmation. Let me give you a, a, a couple other examples from uh, one from my life, one from uh, uh, some lives that you, most of you know. Um, a lot of you were here back in December when we interviewed this couple, Thomas and Lita Lee, uh, on our stage here was a whole service, and they, they, they launched this ministry recently called His Hands on Africa, right? They're doing kind of re outreach and sharing the gospel through dental ministry, and so he was a dentist and so on. You may remember in that story that when God first began to call him to this ministry, it was over 10 years ago, and remember, they were celebrating their 25th anniversary, and so they had planned to go to Africa on safari, and so to celebrate this, and so God speaks to Thomas uh, very directly and tells him, I do want you to go to Africa for your 25th anniversary, but it's not a safari. I want you to go on a medical mission tour trip. I want you to use your dentistry. Now, he had never done anything like this, never thought of doing something like this. And so he, he doesn't tell his wife, not because he's waiting on the Lord, but because he's afraid of his wife. And so he doesn't want to tell her. So he waits like two months, right? And then she's in church. Someone's speaking. The Lord speaks to her and tells her the same thing. On the way home, she says, hey, how would you feel about if instead of going on safari, I feel like the Lord is putting this right, we should go and do a medical mission. And he's super happy that the Lord told her that he doesn't have to. But if you remember that story, they, here's what they said. Remember, this is brand new to them. They've never been to Africa. They've never, this is all brand new. They said, hey, let's pray and ask the Lord for confirmation. That if this is from the Lord, that he would confirm it. When they got home from church that day, 10 minutes after they get home, they get a call from someone in their church saying, hey, this summer, we're going to be leading a medical missionary trip to Rwanda. Would you pray about considering going with us? So you see that confirmation. Uh, that uh, One of the, the big ones in, in our life, Lynn's in my life, when we came to Rocky Peak, you know, we, we came from San Diego. And when you live in San Diego, there's, there's a couple rules. Uh, no, one rule is that anything north of San Juan Capistrano <laughs> is called Los Angeles. <laughs> and the second rule is you don't go there. All right? <laughs> And so when Rocky P came knocking uh, and they asked us to, you know, to consider coming to, to, be, to, to be the lead pastor here, uh, we, we came up the first time uh, in, uh, it, was, it was July 4th weekend of that year. We came incognito just to check it out. And, uh, and so we, we didn't feel like God was calling us here. So we said, you know, we're not interested in that. Thank you anyway. And they came back a second time in August and uh, said, um, hey, would you reconsider? And we said, okay, we did. And we came up and we said, yeah, we don't, we're not feeling it. We don't think this is the right fit. And so we were out. So we're three months into it. We're completely out of the process. And then out of the blue in, the, uh, in January of the next year, uh, that I get a call at 4.15 in the afternoon. And, uh, and I could tell from the very beginning, there's several things, like right away, since God in it, um, and that led to us coming to Rocky Peak. Right? Now, so it's a major life decision for us, right? So what were some of those things? Well, 
Two years before that, God had led me to go on a long fast. It was a 31-day water fast. I mean, it was a major fast. I didn't know why. He, he just called me to do this. Uh, I felt like he was calling me to go on a 40-day water-only fast. I knew it was dangerous to do that. I called five of my friends. I trust their discernment. Hey, would you pray for this? Because I know it's dangerous. They came back to a person. They said yes. The most important person in my life that way is my wife, Lynn. She said, let me, she hates it when I fast because I shrivel up and my back, and all stuff. You know, she's a, a nurturer, right? So I, I was like, Lynn, I hate to tell you this. I feel like the Lord, yeah, yeah. And so she's at work at the time. She calls me 40 minutes later and says, yes, I believe it's from the Lord, but it's going to be a little bit shorter than you think. <laughs> all right. So I head in, right? Turns out to be 31 days at the end, 31 days. During that time, the Lord spoke to me about two different things. One of the things he said is in 18 to 24 months, you're going to go through a major life change. Very confusing to me. Why not just 18 or 24? Why 18 to 24? Well, it turns out in the rearview mirror, we didn't piece this together until after it was all done. The very first time we came to check out Rocky Peak was the eve of 18 months to the day of the start of that fast. And the day that phone call came that changed everything was 24 months to the day. There they had spoke. Two weeks before that, the, our church that I was a part of had asked me to take on a major new initiative, to change direction, what I was doing, a major new initiative that was going to take two to three years. I did not want to do it but I felt like, well, the Lord said 18 to 24 months. I don't know exactly when that timetable is starting, but we're in that zone. And I want to be willing to do whatever he needs for his kingdom, even though I don't want to do this. And so I called the person, uh, a friend of my personal prayer team. She is a woman in her mid-50s, a real prayer warrior. And I said, hey, um, can, you, uh, can you pray about something? The church has asked me to do a new minute. I can't tell you what it is but would you pray about that? And she says, really interesting. I said, why? She said, two days ago, I had a vision and you were in it. And I said, well, what was it? She said, well, you were, um, you were in an airport and you had your boarding pass when you were ready to get onto one flight. And just as you were ready to get on that flight, that, that stewardess came forward and said, no, sir, it's not that flight. It's this flight and changed which plane you boarded. She said, do you know what that means? I said, I don't have a clue. <laughs> but if you, have, if you get anything more, let me know. <laughs> that was two weeks before. Remember, the church has asked me to do this big major initiative. They had come in the week before and said, hey, are you ready to announce to our staff next Wednesday? Our, I'm staffing 200 staff. It's a large church. I want to announce this major initiative, and you're going to be doing it. I said, could you just give me the weekend to pray about it? They said, you always want more time to pray. Said, yes, could I have more time to pray? I said, I'll let you know Tuesday night. Well, that call that changed everything came in Tuesday at 4.15. And while I'm on the phone, my assistant, who was in on all these things of fast and all the thing, she sends me an email while I'm on the phone and says, is this a stewardess with a different destination? And during that time, God opened the door in an amazing way that I never could have foreseen in that phone call to talk with the worship pastor who was here. And this is why we hadn't felt called to come to talk. We just felt like if we came, the worship culture might change here. And we didn't want to come and lead a worship war. And that phone call, I had to talk to the current worship pastor. And I, I said to him, hey, what you do is really excellent. It's done with high excellence that I probably have a, a little different value in, in what I'm looking for in worship and a little different style. And he said, would you share that with me? I said, yes, if you want it. And I shared it with him. And he said, I'm breaking down in tears. I've been praying for four years for God to be, bring me a pastor to mentor me in this area of worship. What had seemed like a completely closed door changed in that moment. And on top of that, he just sensed intuitively the Holy Spirit. God's confirming it with his word. Right? 
So the point is, is that when we're making major life decisions, that often God will confirm it in a wide variety of ways, and that we can ask him to confirm it too, just like Tom and Lita, Tom and Lita did. There in your note sheet, a final quote. Remember we talked about G. Campbell Morgan and his uh, three confirmations. What's the word saying to you? What's the spirit saying to you? And then what are circumstances, open doors? Here's a different take. Dallas quotes a woman I'm not familiar with, but in his book, he says, "If, um, if you believe God has told you to do something, ask him to confirm it to you three times. And so here's her three, through his word, through the circumstances. So those two are the same. But then she adds a different one, through other people who may know nothing of the situation. So what I want you to catch is not that there has to be these three or that three, but you get the concept of multiple. And so Dallas says the precept of three witnesses is not a law, but it's a good rule of thumb in an area where rules of thumb are badly needed. And then number seven. This is one of my favorites. Number seven is the key word is the word success. And the question is, does it work? And what I mean by this is that when God God speaks, when God guides, it bears good fruit. It leads to good things. You know, back in Isaiah, there's a prophecy about the coming of Messiah. And there in your note sheet in, in chapter 11 of Isaiah, He says, when the Messiah comes, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Yahweh will rest on him. Remember how Jesus, the Holy Spirit, was anointed at his baptism with the Holy Spirit. He says, the spirit of the Lord, Yahweh, will rest on him. He says, the spirit is the spirit of wisdom and what? Wisdom and understanding. The spirit of what? Counsel and might of power. The spirit of what? Knowledge. Knowledge. In other words, the Holy Spirit is super smart. The Holy Spirit is super wise. He gives great counsel. And so when someone comes to me and they're always telling me the Lord is leading them and their life is a mess, I'm pretty sure it's not the Holy Spirit because the Spirit leads with wisdom. And this doesn't mean when the Holy Spirit leads us, it doesn't mean that we'll never go through hard times. And it definitely, when I use the word success, I mean success as God would define it in his word. But, what it, but I want, sometimes the Lord will lead us in a way that we do go through very difficult times. It's through those times that we grow. But as a general rule in Scripture, when God is leading, when God speaks to Abraham, when God speaks to David, when he speaks to Moses, when he leads Joshua, hey, Joshua, march around the city seven times, in the, once a day for you know, six days, and the last day, seven, I mean, the walls fall down, right? You don't get to the end of that story, and then, and nothing happened, And this is what you see throughout Scripture is that when God's speaking and leading and guiding, things work. They bear good fruit. And so one of the the questions I've always asked over my lifetime, there's been many times the Lord has asked me to step out on a limb in a way that's like, wow, if God doesn't come through, this isn't going to work. And one of the things I've always held is that like, hey, don't cheat on this. If the Lord is in this, you should sense his blessing. It should bear good fruit. One of the cautions I would, I would give us, I think it's so important, is especially when someone begins to get involved maybe in, in spiritual gifts, some of the more supernatural, obviously supernatural spiritual, gift of knowledge, a gift of wisdom, a gift of prophecy. One of the things I always say is, hey, pay attention to what the Lord is telling you and whether it works or not. Like I always say, hey, keep a journal and when you, whenever you, in your life you sense the Lord is leading you in any area, keep a journal, write down what you think he's leading, and see how that works out. And one of, the, one of the mistakes I see Christians often make, especially when they start moving in the realm of spiritual gifts, like prophecy or gifts of knowledge or so on, and I'm a big fan of all that. I believe God still speaks that way today. But here's one of the mistakes is that often what we do is we, we pay attention to our wins and we ignore our losses. And the longer we go on, we become more and more dependent on our pictures of our mind or what we think the Lord is saying or this recent word, and we start leaving the scripture behind, which is the primary way God's gonna speak, and we get ourselves into trouble. I, I remember 
I had one good friend, really sharp guy, one good friend that began to move. He's very well educated and so on, but he, he began to move in the realm of uh, this other church, was probably kind of getting in the realm of prophecy and that sort of thing. And I remember one time they were going to be doing a missions trip to a foreign country, and he shares with me, hey, this, the Lord has just said this trip's going to be blessed. He made all these, pro- all these prophetic statements about what's going to happen. And I said, oh, great, like, what are they? Like, give me some examples. And he gave them to me. And when he comes back, I asked him, so how did that work? How do these things happen? And you know what? Hardly any had come true, maybe one or two, that if you twisted and bent them, you could say, yeah, I think that kind of was fulfilled. And I asked him about this. Well, how do you understand that? And he said, well, you know, in prophecy, there's a lot of variables and a lot of different people involved that maybe other people didn't obey. And it's like, no, like you were wrong. And so we need to realize that we're learning to hear the voice of the Lord. We need to be really honest with ourselves. What do we sense he's telling us? And, and is that accurate? Did that come true? Because if not, what's going to happen? We're going to be getting off into, into you know, like la-la land and making really horrible decisions that mess up our life because we're becoming increasingly dependent on a word a minute. When the reality is what, what should be the basis of our life is his word, it gives us stability, gives us the mind of God that transforms us. And these others are supplemental things that he needs us for specific situations. So, so does it work? Um, now, so these are seven questions that I think we can ask that are super helpful as we try to learn to discern and grow in the voice, discerning the voice of the Lord. But as we come to this kind of end of this section, this two-week section of how do we discern Um, I want to return to one key principle that I introduced the very first week of this series that's very important. And so there on your note sheet is a section called Hearing God, One Key Principle. And so this is the principle. We talked about week one, that hearing God takes practice. Now, we talked about this very first week of this series that we often tend to assume that if God is speaking, it will be loud and clear. And there's no question, at times it is. But especially when we're learning to discern the still small voice, where God is speaking to us in our thoughts and our ideas, impressions, that, that often it takes us a while to learn this. And so, um, and, and so what, what this means is there's going to be times we get it right, times we get it wrong. We need to pay attention to that and just understand that Uh, it will take some practice. We'll grow in this. Um, Let me give you an example from my life. The very first time I felt like the Lord spoke to me directly, um, I didn't recognize it for about two years. So let me tell you the story. This takes us back to the story we started the day with about this romance, This, this, this man who's met this woman and They've entered this like a magical romance, and yet there's a storm building within him and a decision he has to make. This is a story from my own life. It's a story that happened when I was 16. And the reason I mention that is that for some of us in this room, we're 12, we're 15, we're 18, whatever. And I want you to catch that you don't have to wait till you're 35 to learn how to hear the Lord's voice. God started speaking to Samuel when he was very young. And if we're open and willing to hear God, that God can speak to us when we're very young. And some of the most important lessons of our life can come very young. I can look back, and this experience was one of the most important lessons of my whole life. And it happened when I was 16. So what's the situation? So I've been in a long-term dating relationship for about two years at this point. And it was a very unhealthy relationship for a variety of reasons. But one of the reasons, we kept breaking through, kind of pushing past our sexual boundaries and just a way that just wasn't healthy, right? And so it's one of those Romans 7. I, I don't want to do it, but I end up doing what I want to do. And so after two years, uh, she moves out of state, which was just a gift from God, you know, because it's like this helped us kind of break it off. But because of that, I was so compromised in my walk with the Lord, I just made this vow to the Lord. And I said, Lord, I just want to get close with you. I don't want to, I don't want to like have other, this other God of romance in my, my life. I want to serve you. And, I want to have, and so I make this vow that I'm not going to be dating anyone for a while. I'm just going to focus on my relationship with you and get healed up. 
And so uh, if you were to ask me at the time, well, how long did you make that vow for? I wouldn't have had an answer, but I probably would have answered like, I don't know, six months or a year. I think he'll let me know when it's done or something like that. I don't know. But so right after that, the vow gets tested. About a month later, the vow gets tested. And this is that open door thing. Like Satan can open doors as well as God. And I'm not saying that this was from Satan. She was a one, but anyway, what happened is this new girl moves to our... <laughs> that didn't come out right. Let me vindicate her reputation here. This is my issue. This, this girl moves from San Francisco to, to North San Diego County, starts coming to our church, and she's amazing. She, she's beautiful. She loves Jesus. She's bright. She uh, has a great sense of humor. And, uh, and best of all, she liked me. And so that which was a new experience, all those combination of things. <laughs> anyway... And so because I'm not trying to pursue her in a dating relationship, I'm probably more myself than anyone else. And we just, she loves Jesus. I love, we just begin to grow in this amazing friendship. And so very soon though, we began to realize we're beginning to have romantic feelings for one another, which often happens. You have a great friendship that then, that like can take, can, you know, you're single, can take that turn. And so, so right away, like I, I, I know I can't do this, right? I made this vow to the Lord this like two months before. But this relationship, it, it's like, it's like I feel, what I felt like is she's too good to pass up. Right? Uh, have you ever done that? Yeah. I know what Jesus is saying, but this is too good to pass up. I think I'm smarter. Right, well, I wasn't. And so what happened is that I began to try to ignore my conscience to push this down, and I pursue her, and it's the most amazing relationship I'd ever had at that point in my life. I mean, it's... I seriously, I, I, pinch, I feel like we're in a romantic movie. It's just like, where are the cameras? This is magical. And it goes on like magical for two months, and it's like we're getting very close. But the whole time, I know I'm not supposed to be in this relationship. The whole time, I'm trying to push down my conscience, right? And just hoping that God will change his mind or that somehow he'll say, no, she's from me, you know? Uh, <laughs> skip your vow, forget the vow. And finally, after two months, I'm reading the word one day, and I come across this verse in Proverbs, and I put it there in your note sheet, because I want you to see how this works. He said, the, the verse goes like this, a good name is more desirable than great riches, and to be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Now, on the surface, that sort of has nothing to do with dating this girl, Right? But remember what we learned in this series. This is one of the ways that God speaks to us. He takes a word of God, a scripture, and he applies it to your life in a really powerful and personal way. I did not recognize this as the voice of the Lord, but here's, what, here's how that verse spoke to me. It spoke to me with power, and it said this. It said, Michael, the most important thing about any person is your name. And when the Bible talks about your name, it's talking about your character. It's talking about your integrity. The most important thing about any person is your core character. And the verse, you are violating your integrity at a core level. And it spoke with such power that I knew that I was going to have to break this up. One of the, it was one of the hardest things I'd ever done at that point in my life because in my young life, I was very much in love. Right? And so the night came and I broke up in the worst way possible. Uh, I just wanted to savor this relationship to the end before I obeyed. <laughs> so enjoy it as long as you can. Right? And so I invited her over to church, and after church, we went on a long motorcycle ride. Super romantic. Moonlit night. She's holding on my waist. You know? She's just loving this magical relationship. I, I know, I know. It's <laughs> like... Right, how not to do it, how not to do it, like how stupid, right? And the whole time I'm dying because I'm in this magical relationship's about to come to a crashed end. And we get back, I share with her this vow I'd made and what I'd sensed in the Lord and what I needed to do. And can I tell you, it crushed her heart. Because she'd come out of some bad relationships with people who claimed to be Christians. She thought she'd finally found a young man who was 
passionate about Jesus and could, she could trust her heart to. Just a quick sidebar. Whenever we disobey and rebel, it doesn't just hurt us. And I broke her heart. And you know, over the next two years, I tried to restore that, found that friendship even, but she you know, should always keep me a distance. You know why? She didn't know if she could trust me. And men and women, trust is the currency of relationships. And when trust is broken, there's only a certain level of relationship you can have. Now, why do I share that story? The reason is, if you would have asked me a week after that happened, it's biggest, one of the biggest decisions of my life, has the Lord ever spoken to you in a personal and profound way? Have you ever heard his voice? Has he ever like, given you direction? You know what I would have said? No. And it wasn't until like two years later when I entered in this new phase of my relationship with Jesus, and he began to speak to me in this way, often through Scripture in this way, that I, I realized, oh my goodness, that was the Lord two years ago speaking to me. But like young Samuel, I didn't know it was the Lord. And the reason I share that is, remember, what I'm saying is that learning to hear God's voice sometimes takes practice. And one of my hopes in this series, as we started this series, my guess would be many of us, as I shared that very first week, that we'd say, has God ever spoken to you in a direct and personal way? You'd say, no. I hear other people like that, but I haven't. My hope is that as we've gone through this series, if we looked at the different ways God speaks, for many of us, we began to have my experience. Like, oh, I have experienced that. I have experienced that. Or for those of us who have experienced the Lord speaking, as we've gone through this series, that we become more attentive and we begin to recognize more and more when God is speaking. And so interesting, I didn't expect this from my own life, but I told Lynn just a couple nights ago, it's crazy, but teaching through this series, I'm sensing God directly, especially in that still small, more than I have before that I'm recognizing instead of him repeating a thought three times, I'm picking it up on the first time many times. So this is something we grow in over the course of a lifetime. So I want to encourage you that if you feel like, oh, yeah, I'm not always getting it quite right, or you feel like, yeah, I'm still waiting for that experience, or you're, you're feeling like, hey, I'm just starting to learn, just want to encourage you that what we're learning in this series is to give you the tools of a lifetime to continue growing in this ability to discern, to discern God's voice. We're coming towards the end of the series. We have two more weeks. And so today we're, in it, we're wrapping up this part of how to discern. The next two weeks are going to be very critical weeks. Because the next two weeks, we're going to talk about something that we began to talk about the very first week, the first two weeks. We, we're going to say that if we want to be the person that God speaks to on a regular basis, Basis, we have to become the kind of person that God will speak to. Those who are seeking him with a whole heart, those who are ready, willing to obey, and those who are willing to create space in their life to hear from him. And so the next two weeks, we're going to be talking about what does it look like to pursue God and become the kind of person that God will speak to on a regular basis, and how do we create space in our life to hear from God so that after we leave this series behind, that our trajectory is headed up, that we have not only learned how to discern, but we're becoming the kind of person that God will speak to, and we are creating the kind of rhythms in our life that's creating space for God to speak. Amen? Okay, let's pray together. So, Father, we come today, and we just thank you for uh, this series, what we've been learning, for your beauty of your word. And, Lord, we pray that for all of us, we'd be growing in our discernment, of hearing your voice, and that even more than that, Lord, that we be becoming the kind of person that's pursuing this deep love relationship where our love for you is greater than all other loves, our desire to please you is our top priority, and so we're, we're becoming that kind of person that you can trust yourself to and you can share your heart with because we're no longer using you for our purposes, that we're pursuing you for your purposes. 
And so, Lord, as we sing this song that really puts a lot of that, a lot of those thoughts into words, we pray, Lord, truly that you would become our first allegiance. We pray this in your name. And everyone said,